Today I want to share with you the Little House on the Prairie pumpkin pie recipe. This is perfect for your traditional Thanksgiving table or even your pioneer themed Thanksgiving table. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below that'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now I just want to take a minute to talk a little bit about the Little House on the Prairie books and the corresponding cookbook. However, if you want to just jump ahead and start making the pumpkin pie, be sure to open the description underneath this video where I'll have the timestamps covering everything that I'm going to do. If you grew up reading the Little House on the Prairie books or if you missed out on reading them as a child but you've read them now as an adult to your children or your grandchildren or your nieces and nephews, you know how beloved these stories are. And there's even a cookbook that goes along with the wonderful Little House on the Prairie stories. It's called The Little House Cookbook and it's written by Barbara M. Walker. And the subtitle is Frontier Foods from Laura Ingalls Wilder's Classic Stories. And the illustrations, which are absolutely darling, are by Garth Williams, who if you are familiar with various children's books, you'll be very familiar with his drawings. And it's this pumpkin pie recipe that we're going to make today that's based on the pumpkin pie recipe in this cookbook, which Miss Walker discusses that this is how Ma Ingalls would have made a pumpkin pie. Now the edition of this cookbook was printed in 1979 and I actually bought this book used. So keep an eye out for it if you have used bookstores in your area. And if I can find this online, I'll definitely link to it in the description below. But I also believe there are more recent editions as well. First, we're going to make Ma Ingalls pie crust, and then we're going to make Ma Ingalls pumpkin pie filling. Now, I just want to take a minute to read to you some of what Miss Walker, the author of this cookbook, writes about the role of pumpkin pie in the Little House books. The recipe here is for pumpkin pie as it may have been made in the big woods with few eggs and Ma's maple sugar. Now don't worry if you don't have maple sugar. Miss Walker does give a substitution saying that you can use brown sugar and maple flavoring. And speaking of ingredients, I'll go over everything, but you don't need to write anything down. If you open the description under this video, you'll see the word recipe with a link. That'll take you over to my website, Mary's Nest, same name as my YouTube channel, where you can read the recipe online or print it out. Now we'll talk about the pumpkin ingredients uh, as we get to that part of the recipe, but we're going to make the pie crust first, Ma's pie crust, Ma Ingalls pie crust. So I just want to read to you a little bit about how pioneers tended to make pie crusts. Now interesting to note, the terminology that we use, oh I'm going to make a pie crust, is somewhat more of a modern term. When you look back at recipes from the pioneer days and even before that, if you look at uh, vintage cookbooks or antique cookbooks from uh, colonial America or England, often a pie crust is referred to as a pie paste. So the recipe in this Little House cookbook is for a family paste for pies. Now we're just going to make a single pie crust since we're doing a pumpkin pie, but Miss Walker does say that this can be doubled if you want to make a, a two pie crusts for a covered pie. And another interesting thing which I think you will find different than how we would make a pie crust for when making a pumpkin pie or other similar custard based pie. What Miss Walker shares here is today we pre-bake pie shells, meaning you would roll out your crust, put it in your pie pan, put down some parchment paper, some pie weights or beans that you use as pie weights and bake your pie crust partially and then fill it with your custard filling and then put it back in the oven to bake and this would prevent your pie crust from absorbing a lot of the liquid, your raw pie crust from absorbing a lot of the liquid and becoming soggy. However, Miss Walker shares that frontier cooks as a rule 
expected the bottom crust to absorb juices and grease the pie pan instead and grease the pie pan to prevent the wet crust from sticking. So this is very interesting and it'll be interesting to see how the texture of our pie crust comes out. Now to make this pie crust, we're gonna need one and a quarter cups of all-purpose flour. We're going to need a half a teaspoon of salt and we're going to need a third of a cup of lard and a half a teaspoon of butter, both of which I have in the refrigerator right now. Generally, when you're making a pie crust, the colder you can keep your ingredients, the better. Now, did the pioneers have the luxury of modern refrigeration? No, so maybe they kept their lard and their butter outside this time of year where it would be cooler. However, it is very interesting that Ma Ingalls leaned more to using lard when making her pie crust with just a little bit of butter for flavor. And what I'm theorizing is that lard is incredibly forgiving. If you've ever made a pie crust with lard, you know that you can pretty much just throw your lard in, whether it's cold or room temperature or whatever the case may be, and you're gonna get a pretty flaky pie crust. And when lard was somewhat maligned as not being good for us, you found that those solid shortenings became very popular that are sold in the can at the grocery store, and they were somewhat mimicking lard. And if you've ever made a pie crust with those vegetable, those hydronated vegetable shortenings that come in the can, you will find you can make a very a uh, nice light flaky pie crust with them. However, that may not be the healthiest option for you. Lard has really been redeemed, uh, I think part of with the keto movement and the low carb movement and just generally because of the traditional foods movement that is, come, is bringing us back to using traditional fats in our cooking. And if you're interested in learning more about lard, I have a video where I show you how to make lard and I talk about the difference between regular lard and leaf lard. And it's the leaf lard, if you can find it, that works very well for baking because it has very little uh, aroma uh, related to the pork. It's removed from around the kidneys of the pig and then rendered. And then you have leaf lard and it's very much prized by bakers. But don't worry if all you can find is back fat from the pig to render into lard uh, because even that type of lard will work very well in baking. And if you decide you just want to buy lard, look for natural lard, lard that has been rendered from pork fat and is simply in that state, that natural state. You want to avoid lard that has, in addition to being rendered, also been hydronated. And it will say that on the package if it has in fact been hydronated, but hydronated fats are generally not very good for our health. So best to avoid that. Well, the first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and add my salt to the flour. And then I'm just going to whisk this just to get the salt distributed well through the flour. So here's my leaf lard, and this is my leaf lard right here that I rendered from the leaf pork fat. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this right in with the flour. Now this is cold, but even if your lard isn't cold, like I said, I'm not, I wouldn't worry too much about it. I think it's gonna turn out okay. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put in my little half teaspoon of butter. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use this tool, which is called a pastry cutter, to cut my fat into my flour. But don't worry if you don't have this. You can do this with two forks, or you can even do this with two knives. And all you're looking at doing is mixing the fat and the flour together so that it resembles coarse sand with sort of some little pebbles of fat also in it. And if it's easier for you, Miss Walker in her cookbook actually recommends that if you go ahead and wash your hands in cold water, that you can just use your fingertips to work the fat into the flour. But I'll go ahead and start mixing this with the pastry cutter. And you'll find that it, when you do this, you having a knife handy to loosen the cold fat as it becomes more incorporated with your flour does make the job a little easier. 
Now, once you've got your lard and your butter well distributed through your flour and you have uh, what looks like coarse sand with pebbles in it, now you want to have some ice water at the ready. Now, Miss Walker recommends that we add three tablespoons of ice water to our mixture as we continue creating this into our pie paste. Now I'll just start with that one tablespoon and start working it through. How much water you actually add when you're making a pie crust can be a little tricky because it can often depend on the conditions in your kitchen, the weather outside, and so on and so forth. But never worry, if you find you've added too much water, you can just sprinkle in a little more flour. And if you find that it's just dry, your pie crust is dry and it's not coming together, then you can just add a little extra water. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in my second tablespoon of water and I'm just going to switch to a fork now as I start to see how this is coming together. Now maybe my Ingalls just used some room temperature water from a pitcher, I don't know. I think the fact that we are using lard uh, does make this a very forgiving pie crust, but maybe Laura brought in some uh, cold water from outside, or maybe they had snow uh, this time of year uh, when my Ingalls was making pumpkin pies, so maybe they brought in a, a little snow and let that melt and use that cold water. I don't know. If you're a food historian or you know a lot about this subject, please share with us in the comments. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in my last tablespoon of ice water, and I suspect that'll be enough. All you want to do is toss this about gently to incorporate the water. Nothing fancy, no pressing. Don't be hard with it or, or harsh on it. <laughs> Just toss it very gently to get that nice cold water incorporated. Now you may be wondering why I'm talking about having the fat be cold and then using ice water, especially if you're new to making a pie crust. The reason we want the fat to stay cold is we don't want it to mix completely with the flour. We want there to be some chunks of fat throughout the flour because when you go and roll out your pie crust, it's those little chunks of fat that release steam when you go to bake your pie crust and it's that steam that causes your pie crust to be light and flaky. However, as I mentioned, lard is very forgiving. So I think the fact that if you are new to baking or, or making a pie crust, if you can source some lard, I think you will find that you're going to be successful in making a flaky pie crust, even if everything is not perfectly cold. Now the next thing we're going to do is take our mixture and we're going to form this, our pie paste or our pie crust dough, into a disc. And then we're going to refrigerate it while we make the pumpkin pie filling. Now Miss Walker shares that maybe in the hot summer months, Ma Ingalls would have placed her dough, her pie paste or her pie crust dough, into a tin or whatever she had and put that into some cold well, just rested it down into some cold well water to keep everything cold. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually cheating a little. I'm using a little plastic wrap that I'll wrap my dough in. Miss Walker doesn't really explain what Ma Ingalls uh, might have wrapped her dough in if she wrapped it at all. But I find doing this in a little plastic wrap like this instead of just with my hands on a board makes it a little easier. And all I like to do is just take my plastic wrap, turn it periodically, and just start to squeeze my pie paste, <laughs> I like saying that, <laughs> my pie crust dough into a disc shape. Now once you get your pie crust dough into somewhat of a disc shape, then what I like to do is just simply go ahead and wrap it up with my plastic wrap and then I'll go ahead and refrigerate this while we're making the pumpkin pie filling. Now, something that I want to share with you is as you're pulling this together into a, a disc shape, don't worry if you see some cracks. That's okay because the reason we're going to let this pie dough rest 
really is twofold and rest in the refrigerator, not just to keep the fat cold, but it gives the liquid that we added, those three tablespoons of cold water, some time to hydrate the flour. So don't rush to add water to say, oh, I think it's not, um, it's not, you know, uh, moist enough. It's, chances are it's going to be okay. So I just want to reassure you about that. Alrighty, well let me get this all nice and pulled together and we'll go ahead and we'll put this in the fridge and let it chill. While our pie crust is chilling, now we'll make our pumpkin custard. Now something I have to read to you here that I think is very cute. Now keep in mind, Ma Ingalls was growing pumpkins and making her own pumpkin puree to be used to make pumpkin pie. So that's certainly something that you can do. And the recipe is in this book. But I am taking a little shortcut and I'm using canned pumpkin puree. But I think that this line is so cute uh, that Miss Walker has taken uh, from one of the Little House books. And it says, Laura stood on a chair and watched the pumpkin from Ma and stirred it with a wooden paddle. She held the paddle in both hands, can't you just picture Laura? And stirred carefully, because if the pumpkin burned, there wouldn't be any pumpkin pies. Now this recipe calls for two cups of pumpkin puree. Now, if you buy a can of pumpkin puree at the grocery store, the regular size cans are usually 15 ounces, and that's gonna contain about a cup and three quarters. Now you may try to squeak by with this recipe and hopefully it'll come out okay, but if you wanna go for the whole two cups, then you will need to open up another can of pumpkin puree and scoop out a quarter cup and then use your leftover pumpkin puree to make something else. But if you like Ma Ingalls or the Pioneers and you're just making your own pumpkin puree, you're gonna have plenty and you can just use two cups of that uh, for this uh, pumpkin pie recipe. So I've got my two cups of pumpkin puree here. And remember, if you open the description under this video, you'll see the link to the recipe, so you don't need to write anything down. But in any event, I'll go over all the details with you. Two cups of pumpkin puree, and you're going to need two thirds of a cup of the maple sugar, if you have it. If not, you're gonna want two thirds of a cup of brown sugar, and then you're gonna want a teaspoon of maple flavoring. And next, you're gonna need two eggs. Next, the recipe calls for one and a quarter cups of rich milk. Now, what exactly was rich milk? What did the pioneers mean when they would write down a recipe or use the term rich milk? Different food historians have different opinions on this. And if you've researched this and you have some knowledge about it, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. But basically what I've surmised is that you have to keep in mind that the pioneers had milk that was not homogenized. When it came out of the cow, there was milk and then there was the cream that would float to the top. Today, because of modern practices known as homogenization, we can buy milk where the cream has been forced to stay mixed in with the milk. And that generally is called whole milk. It's the full fat milk. So some food historians theorize that it's that full fat milk where the pioneer home cook took the milk from the cow and shook it to make sure that the cream and the milk became mixed together and then poured some of that to use in whatever they were cooking because often the milk that was on the bottom was milk that would be used to drink or to use in, in various types of cooking. And that cream would be separated out and be used to make butter or other dairy products or simply may be used in the mother and father's coffee. So what Miss Walker recommends to try to be as close as we can to what the pioneers were doing is to either use a full fat whole, whole milk or a half and half. 
And the reason that half and half may be recommended is because the cows that the pioneers may have had, their one, maybe just their one dairy cow for a family, would have produced most likely a very rich milk, somewhat richer than the commercially produced milks that we receive today from the cows. You'll often hear about certain breeds of cattle that provide, or certain breeds of dairy cows that provide very rich milk, like the Jersey cows. And so that may be very similar to what our pioneers had. But today, Jersey cows make up a small percentage of the cows that provide milk. And it's often highlighted that that particular milk came from cows like the Jersey cows, or, and you have to forgive me if I'm not pronouncing this right, is it Guernsey? The Guernsey cows also produce a very rich milk uh, versus, I think, just the general most common uh, dairy cow like the Holstein, which produces a less, uh, less cream and a less rich milk. So I'm going to go ahead and use uh, one and a quarter cups of just whole full fat milk. As I said, you can also try half and half. And if you've seen many pumpkin pie recipes out there, they will often call for evaporated milk. So you can certainly use evaporated milk since that would be richer than just unevaporated milk since it's concentrated. But I would not recommend using sweetened condensed milk because that's going to make your pumpkin pie just way too sweet. Now I want to mention that if you're interested in learning how to make your own evaporated milk or how to make your own sweetened condensed milk, I have videos on both of those and it's very easy to do and I'll be sure to link to that in the iCards and in the description below. Finally, the recipe calls for ground cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, ginger, or a pinch of whatever you have. I thought this was very cute because I would imagine that spices were probably at a premium for the pioneers. And so it might have literally just been a pinch and it was really basically going to be pretty much whatever they had. So what I've got here is just a teaspoon of homemade pumpkin pie spice. And Miss Walker recommends that yes, you can use a pumpkin pie spice. And if you'd like to learn how to make your own pumpkin pie spice and a whole host of other homemade spices and spice blends, uh, I have a video on that and I'll be sure to link to it in the iCards and in the description below. And then finally, all you need is a pinch of salt. Now the first thing in this recipe calls for are two eggs and to beat them well. So we'll give them a real good whisking. Well, I've whisked these eggs really well or beat them. I always feel sorry to say beat the eggs. I whisk, whisk them really well. And then the recipe calls to go ahead and add in the sugar that we're using. I've got the maple sugar or the brown sugar, the milk, the salt, and the maple flavoring if you're using the brown sugar, and the spices, and our pumpkin puree. So I've got that sugar in there. I'll go ahead and add my milk. And then next we're going to put in our pinch, just a pinch of salt. That's cute, just a pinch. <laughs> and then we're going to go ahead and add in our spices. I'm going to get the rest of that out in a minute. And then we'll go ahead and add in our pumpkin puree. I'm just going to get the last little bit of goodness of those spices out of my bowl. So you just want to whisk this until it's nice and smooth and everything is incorporated. And you'll be able to tell that you'll just see the little bit of spices maybe sprinkled throughout. But other than that, the sugar will have dissolved and the eggs will be completely incorporated with this glorious custard mixture. Well, my pie crust is nice and cold, so we'll get ready to roll this out. And I just want to mention one thing, that I have another recipe for a no-roll pie crust that you could also improvise with in this recipe if you're hesitant to actually make a homemade pie crust, especially if you're new to baking. And it's very cute because I have a story to share with you. My husband said, how is this pumpkin pie you're making different than the other one that you make? And so I said, well, the other one has a no-roll crust, so it's extremely extremely easy and it just requires butter, no lard. And he said, oh, okay, that's sort of like a pumpkin pie for the little house in the city. Now, I thought that was really cute. Now, so that our dough doesn't stick when we go to roll it out, 
we want to just flour our board. And you don't have to go crazy. You just want to have enough flour on here so that your pie crust doesn't stick. Once you get your pie crust dough unwrapped and onto your floured board, then you just want to go ahead and sprinkle a little flour on top too, so that when we go to roll it out, it won't stick to our rolling pin. Now this is my mom's rolling pin, and it reminds me very much of something I would see the pioneers rolling out a pie dough with. And this is what they call, I think like a French rolling pin maybe. Uh, but this also works very well too, if you have one of these. But we'll try to be and uh, look a little more like the pioneers. And so we'll use this more American style one. And what you want to do is you're just going to roll out and you're going to kind of start with your rolling pin in the middle and then you're going to roll out and you're periodically going to want to rotate your uh, pie crust so that it's never sticking to the board. Now you just want to keep rolling this out and rotating it until you get to something that's kind of a rough shaped circle that's about two inches larger than your pie plate. So this is getting close, but I'm just going to roll it out a little more. And speaking of pie plates, you want just a regular pie plate. You don't need a deep dish pie plate or an extra large pie plate, nothing like that. Just your standard regular pie plate. I'm using glass. If you have metal, that's fine too. Well, I rolled this out a little more and now I'm going to measure this with my pie plate. And it's just perfect, about two inches larger than my pie plate. Now I'm just going to fold this over onto my rolling pin and we're going to transfer it to the pie plate. Now you may recall earlier in this video, we talked about the difference between the modern day pie crusts and where there's a lot of pre-baking or blind baking going on before you even put your custard into your pie, but that the pioneers often just went ahead and put their pie crust or their pie paste right into their pie plate and then poured their filling and into the oven it went. However, you may remember that Miss Walker mentioned that they grease their pie plate to prevent any sticking of a more or what may potentially be a slightly wetter pie crust. So it's going to be interesting to see exactly how it comes out. So I suspect Ma Ingalls may have greased hers with lard. I'm not sure, but I went ahead and greased mine with butter. Now I'm just going to unroll this pie crust right over my pie plate. Now you just want to gently use your fingers to push your pie crust down or your pie crust dough down into your pie plate. Yeah, so any of these longer pieces, you can just take your kitchen shears and just trim it off a little bit just so that you have just kind of now about a one inch overhang. The next thing you want to do is take your pie crust dough and just tuck it under right onto the rim of your pie plate. So you just continue on going all around, just folding in this extra dough that's hanging over the edge. Now my pie plate has handles on it, so I'm just gonna work around that best I can. Now, if you have any pie scraps like this and you get a tear in your crust, you can simply use those to patch the tear or you can re-roll these into a bowl. And if you have a little cookie cutter, maybe that has some leaf shapes or a little pumpkin shape, something like that, you can make little uh, pie crust dough cookies out of them and use them to uh, decorate your pie. If you want, you can just leave the edge very rustic like that once you've tucked under your dough, or you can go around it and do what's called crimping. And basically all I do is take my index finger on my right hand, my thumb and my index finger on my left hand, and simply just make a little motion like this where I go all around just crimping the edge of my pie crust. And there you have it, just with a nice little crimping decoration all around the top of the crust. And I do want to mention for you ladies out there who have long fingernails, I don't, <laughs> you can definitely just use your knuckle. Now we're going to very carefully pour our custard mixture into our pie shell. Now I also want to show you with my little bit of scrap, I didn't have a lot left from the pie crust, but I had a little bit. And so I just used a knife to make a little leaf and I'll bake this along with my pie and then we can use it for a little decoration on the baked pumpkin pie. Now I just want to mention that my, the pie plate that I'm using is a rounded one. The edges are rounded instead of sort of flanged out when, with the way you might see a typical uh, 
pie plate, uh, but it doesn't matter. Whatever pie plate you have is going to work perfectly. Mine may just look a little different because I do have more of the straight sides. Now the recipe recommends to preheat your oven to 425 degrees and then go ahead and put your pie into the oven at 425 degrees, but for only 10 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, we're going to turn it down to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. And she said the entire baking process should take about 40 minutes. And the way we'll know that this is done is if you stick a knife into it, which we can always cover up with a little whipped cream. <laughs> if we stick a knife into it and the knife comes out clean, we know that it's baked. Now, something that I'm going to do that I want to add that's not specified in the recipe, but just based on my cooking experience, my home cooking experience, I'm going to put this pie on the lower uh, half of my oven to bake. And that's because we didn't blind bake or pre-bake the crust. And I'm hoping that by baking this on the lower rack, in the, in the lower third, so to speak, of my oven that we can hopefully help the crust bake well and not be particularly moist. Now, I don't think it's going to, I think lard just works so well in a pie crust. I really think that it's going to come out fine. So even if you want to just go ahead and put this on your middle rack, just in the traditional way of baking a pie, that'll be fine too. And if during the baking process at any time your crust looks like it's getting too brown, you can always tent this with a little foil or if you have one of those pie crust rings that are just a ring that you can place on top of your pie but then leaves the center of the pie exposed, you can also use that. Well, I had this in my oven for 40 minutes and I checked it at 40 minutes, but it didn't quite look done yet. So I let it go for another five minutes or so, checked it again, felt it still needed another five minutes. So it did cook for about, or it did bake for about 50 minutes. So even though the original recipe called for 40 minutes, every oven is different. So check your pie at 40 minutes. And even if it doesn't look done, don't worry. Know that you can let it go a little longer and it will cook beautifully. And I just have to say, I think this looks so wonderful, so rustic, so pioneer. I'm really very pleased with how this pumpkin pie turned out. Now I want to share a tip with you. If you're a beginning baker, you may feel most comfortable to take a knife and insert it uh, into your pie. And if it comes out clean, then you know it's done. And then you can just cover up that little mark with some whipped cream. However, another way to know that your pie is done is when it's in your oven, it'll darken in color as this did from when we poured the original custard in and it puffs up ever so slightly. And that's usually an indication that it's still done. And if there's a little wiggle in the middle, when you test, you know, when you open your oven and you see it's puffed up a little and the crust is brown nicely and you maybe give it a little shake and there's a little bit of a wiggle right in the center, that's fine. A little bit of a wiggle is what you want to look for. You don't want to over bake your pumpkin pie. The reason that you don't want to overbake your pumpkin pie is if you've ever seen pumpkin pies that have a lot of liquid on top, that usually indicates they've been overbaked. And what's happened is, and I'm not a scientist, I don't know the exact reason, the chemical reason, but it generally has something to do with the eggs breaking down and releasing some of their liquid. And then that's what causes the liquid to pool on top of your pumpkin pie. So if at 40 minutes, it's puffed up a little, the crust is brown, chances are it's done. Or you can always go ahead and check it with your knife. And if the crust hasn't quite browned up enough yet, and you really don't see a little bit of a puff uh, of the pumpkin, uh, the pumpkin custard in the middle of your pumpkin pie, uh, then just let it go a little longer as I did. 
And something that I really like, this is cooling a bit so I can hold it now, but something that I really like about using a glass pie pan is that it really gives me a good view as to how the crust is coming along. And I can see that the crust is nice and golden both on the sides and on the bottom. So if you've never baked with glass before, if you tend to bake with metal pie pans and you're always a little unsure, is it done? Is the crust right? What's going on? Sometimes for new bakers, I find that a glass pie pen, a pie pan, a glass pie pan can be your best friend. Alrighty, well, Miss Walker says to allow this pie to cool, but do not chill before serving. So that's probably exactly what Ma Ingalls would have done. She would have let it cool to room temperature and then served it to her family for dessert. So I'm going to let this cool to room temperature, then we'll slice it and we'll give it a taste and we'll look at how the pumpkin pie custard part came and how the crust looks as well. And I've got my little leaf here that I also baked in my oven to use as a decoration. So we're all set. Well, this pie has cooled beautifully to room temperature. So now I'm ready to give it a slice. So let's just go right in here. Oh, it feels lovely. And let's get that crust. Oh yeah, it doesn't seem like it's sticking in the least. So that's good news. Oh, and so far, this looks very flaky. Now what I like to do when I cut a pie, just to try to make things as even as possible, is to cut it in half, then to cut it into quarters, and then to cut it into eighths. And so I've got one eighth of the pie here. Wow, this just comes out beautifully from that greasing the pie tin. Oh my gosh, this looks glorious. Oh, I have to give you a close up. This custard looks so luscious and the crust, definitely when I was slicing it, it's so flaky. Now I'm trying to show you this bottom crust up close and how actually flaky it came, but let's slice into it and taste it and see if we can get a closer look at this crust. But first, oh yeah, maybe we can see it on the bottom here. Yeah, I mean, it's well cooked and definitely looks, I'm gonna just try to take it away from the custard part, but let's taste this custard and see how it came. Mmm, mmm, that's delicious. Oh, that, it, it's not a strong maple flavor that comes through, it's just a delightful sweetness. Now, I'm gonna just pull this part off and I'm gonna take some close-up pictures. Wow, this is so flaky, thanks to that lard. Mmm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a wonderful pie crust. Let's take a taste with the custard and the bottom crust in place and we'll see how that comes. Mmm. Oh, this is wonderful. This has a delightful pumpkin flavor and the crust is not soggy in the least. Well, I hope you've enjoyed making this little house on the prairie pumpkin pie with me. It's really delicious and the crust is so flaky and no blind baking. It's a real time saver. I hope you'll give this a try. And now if you'd like more recipes for Thanksgiving, including how to make two small turkeys instead of one big one, which is a lot easier, be sure to click on this playlist where I have a whole host of recipes for you. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless and Happy Thanksgiving!